It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. The Lord Jesus instituted two ordinances to be observed by the church. One is baptism and the other is communion. Communion is to be observed often as a sign of our continuing fellowship with Christ, our remembrance of what he did for us, of all who would believe. Today, we again want to focus on our Savior Jesus. We recall that he is the author and perfecter of our faith. God appointed him heir of all things. He is the radiance of his Father's glory and the exact representation of his nature. He is also our substitute who went to the cross to pay the price of our sin. Through the work of Jesus on the cross, we are not only forgiven, but we have been restored to the one true God. God is our Father, who carefully watches over his children. And in Christ, we have the hope of heaven. As a part of remembering Christ, our passage today is Hebrews 2, verse 9. If you have a Bible, please turn to this passage and read along with me. If you do not have a Bible, there are men in the front who are ready to put one in your hands. If you don't have a Bible, please feel free to take this, this one with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. It is of you, by you, and for you. It is living and active and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. And we are so thankful for the gift of salvation that through the hope or through the help of our Holy Spirit, it draws us closer to you, draws us to your ways. We look forward to this time that we have fellowship with you and with those who are here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews 2, verse 9. <clears throat> Let's read together. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. I love this passage because it portrays the humility of Christ. If you look at it, it can be seen all throughout this verse. First, we see that for a little while he was made lower than the angels. Philippians 2.7 says that Jesus emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Jesus took on the form of a man. His nature was not changed. He did not cease to be God. But for a little while, actually 33 years, he was made lower than the angels. Prior to this, he'd always been higher than the angels. In fact, he created the angels. He ruled over the angels. Angels worshiped and adored him. And he was served by angels. His humiliation did not end with being made lower than the angels. He humbled himself unto death, even death on a cross. His death was accompanied by torture, excruciating pain, and abandonment. It was also accompanied by the unfathomable agony of knowing that being obedient, he had to die. He was deserted by his friends, he was suffering for something that he did not do. And mostly, he was forsaken by his father as he took on the sins of all who would believe. So today, when we think about Jesus as our substitute, we have to remember that he, as God, was made lower than the angels. As one commentator would put it, he came down to earth to do what men do and that was to die. And 
and that was the extent of his humiliation, his death. I want to just share with you briefly the purpose, the motive, and the result of Jesus' humiliation as he as presented in this passage. What was the purpose? Well, let's go to the end of the verse. It says, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. The word taste means to experience. To taste death for everyone means he experienced death in our place. He was our substitute. He bore our sins in his own body on the cross. God punished him instead of us, even though he was guilty of nothing. He tasted death for everyone who would ever believe in him. Christian, this is the gospel. This is the good news. What was the motive of Jesus' humiliation? The motive was none other then it was God's plan from the beginning of time. His plan was uninfluenced by anyone or anything. In the beginning, it was only God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God, before the creation of anything, determined that he was going to create and redeem sinners purely on the result of his grace. It was a gracious gift, a gracious act of God by which he chose to redeem sinners based on no merit of ours, no worthiness, nothing that we would deserve. God just simply demonstrated his love toward us. His gracious love came in the form of giving up his son to die in our place. What was the result of Jesus' humiliation? It is indicated in the middle of verse 9, he was crowned with glory and honor. Because of Jesus' obedience, God has highly exalted him, making him heir of all things, and all things are subject to him. Recalling the saving grace of God and the fact that Jesus tasted death for all who would believe should cause us all to fall on our faces in worship and gratitude. In a moment, the men will pass out the bread and the juice. Believers, in your meditation of what we have in Christ, please take the time to remember the humility that he experienced on our behalf. Remember that it pleased God to crush his son so that we can enjoy the privilege of his unconditional love. However, if you are here today and you don't know God's saving grace, we want you to know that we are so glad you could join us this morning. As you have heard, communion is a time for those of us who know Christ, a time for believers to re reflect on all that we have in Christ. So we ask that you please allow the bread and the juice to pass you by. However, if something has made you question your unbelief, please ask God to reveal himself to you. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Ask God to forgive you of your sins and to save your soul from eternal damnation. Please feel free to talk with anyone that you see up front today, any of the elders or the person who brought you about what it would take, what it means to receive the free gift of eternal life. Men, come and serve us.